aspartate transcarbamoylase, or ATCase, is this enzyme found inside our cells that catalyzes the first step in the biosynthesis of pyrimidine-based nucleoside triphosphate molecules such as CTP or citidine triphosphates. And this enzyme is actually controlled by these CTP molecules because they can ultimately go back and bind onto special regulatory sites, allosteric sites, found on the enzyme and that inhibits the activity of the enzyme. And so that's why we call aspartate transcarbamoylase an allosteric enzyme. Now, what we want to focus on in this lecture is the actual structure of aspartate transcarbamoylase, and then we want to discuss what happens to that structure of the enzyme once the substrate molecule actually binds onto the active side of the enzyme. So, let's begin by describing the structure. Now, this enzyme has quaternary structure, and what that means is it consists of multiple subunits. And there are two types of multi-subunit structures. One of them we call a catalytic trimer. And we call it catalytic because it contains the active sites. The other one is called a regulatory dimer. And we call this one regulatory because that's where that regulatory molecule binds to. The CTP molecule binds to the regulatory dimer as we'll see in the next lecture. So, each one of these catalytic trimers actually consists of three individual but identical catalytic chains, and that's why we call it a trimer. So C3, where C stands for catalytic, and 3 stands for trimer. And we actually have two of these catalytic trimers. So we have a total of 2 multiplied by 3, so 6, of these individual but identical catalytic chains. On the other hand, we have three of these regulatory dimers, and each dimer consists of two identical chains, two identical regulatory chains. And so we also see that we have three times two, so six of these regulatory chains. So we have six catalytic chains, we have six regulatory chains to make a total of 12 of these subunits that make up the quaternary structure of aspartate transcarbamoylase. And if we examine the three-dimensional structure of this molecule from top to bottom, this is basically what we see. So these red dimers are the regulatory dimers. So each one of these dimers consists of one, two, one, two, one, two of these regulatory chains. And this entire orange structure constitutes a single catalytic trimer. So we have one, two, three of these orange subunits. Each one of these orange subunits is a catalytic chain, and three of these catalytic chains arranged in this triangular format make up that catalytic trimer. Now, because we're examining the structure from top to bottom, the other trimer is hiding beneath this trimer. So, if we take this structure and flip it this way, we're going to see this on top, and the other trimer is basically found on the bottom. So, we have a total of two catalytic trimers and three of these dimers on the sides. So, we have this triangular form as shown in this diagram. Now, the question is, what exactly is the interaction like between regulatory dimers and these catalytic trimers? Well, it turns out that each one of the regulatory chains in each one of these dimers interacts with one of these catalytic chains in each one of these catalytic trimers. And this interaction is made better, it is amplified by the presence of a metal atom, of a zinc metal atom. So, if we examine, so let's take a look at one of these red structures, let's say we're examining this regulatory structure here, so this is basically what we're going to see. So, we have a bunch of these beta chains, we have some of these alpha chains, and right about here, at the interface between the red regulatory chain and this orange catalytic chain, we're going to find a zinc atom. And that zinc atom interacts with the cysteine residues, with four cysteine residues, and that basically amplifies, it makes better, the interaction between the orange chain, the catalytic chain, and the red chain, that regulatory chain. So,
Each R regulatory subunit contains a zinc domain that contains the zinc metal atom that interacts with the C subunit, the catalytic subunit. So again, each one of these red regulatory chains in the dimer interacts with one of these catalytic chains in that catalytic trimer via this metal atom that is present within the end portion, the interface section of each one of these regulatory chains. Now, when scientists were basically studying this molecule, how exactly did they actually discover where the active site is found within this molecule? Well, instead of actually using the substrate molecules for this enzyme, they used an inhibitor, a irreversible inhibitor to this enzyme. They synthesized an irreversible inhibitor that resembles the two substrate molecules of this particular enzyme. So remember, what ATCase actually does, it catalyzes the conversion of a molecule called aspartate and a second molecule called carbamoyl phosphate. So it combines these two molecules to form the N carbamoyl aspartate as well as a single orthophosphate molecule. Now, what this molecule does, the scientists created, so scientists created this irreversible inhibitor, a bisubstrate analog known as the PALA molecule, which stands for N-phosphoacetyl-L-aspartate. And the structure of this PALA molecule resembles the intermediate molecule that is formed in the biosynthesis of the CTP molecule. And this is what PALA actually looks like. So, PALA resembles an intermediate in the reaction pathway and is therefore a highly potent, a highly effective inhibitor. It binds onto the active side because it resembles the bisubstrate analog that is formed as an intermediate in this particular reaction. And so once it binds onto the active side, it binds irreversibly and it does not let go and that inhibits the activity of this enzyme. Now, once we actually bind the polymolecule molecule to the active side, that also, that not only tells us well, that where the active side is found, but it can also be used to basically study what kind of structural changes actually take place within the enzyme, as we'll see in just a moment. Now, one thing I'd like to point out about the active side of the enzyme, wherever that active side is, um, we have these three negative charges on this polymolecule. molecule. And the fact that we have three negative charges basically implies that inside the active side of this enzyme we'll find residues that contain positive charges. So basically those positive charges in the residue interact with the negative charges of this bisubstrate analog molecule, the polymolecule. molecule. So the next question is, what exactly did scientists see when they mixed the PALA with this enzyme. Well, what they saw was where that PALA actually bound to was at the interface between any pair of these catalytic chains within that trimer. So the PALA inhibitor binds onto a region located on the boundaries of each pair of catalytic subunits in any one of those catalytic trimers. And because we have three of these boundaries between the pairs in any given trimer, we see that we have three of these chain, uh, three of these active sites in any trimer, and because we have two trimers, that implies we must have six active sites. So we see that the quaternary structure of the ATCase actually consists of six individual active sites, and that means if all those active sites are occupied at some given moment in time, six of these reactions are taken in place at the same exact moment in time. So this is where poly so this is let's suppose the poly molecule it binds onto this location, the first active site, this location, the second uh, active site and the third active site as well. And of course, if we flip it this way, we're going to see the other catalytic trimer and it also contains six uh, it also contains three of these active sites. Now, the final question I'd like to explore is, 
what did scientists actually see when that pollen molecule was bound onto the active side? What types of structural changes actually took place in the quaternary structure of this ATCase allosteric enzyme? Well, just like as we discussed, in hemoglobin, when the oxygen molecules are not bound to the heme groups of hemoglobin, that hemoglobin molecule ex exists in the T state, in the tense state. And what that means is the entire quaternary structure is constrained and so the affinity of the heme groups for oxygen is very low. And in the same analogous way, because this allosteric enzyme basically exhibits cooperativity, it also exists in the T state as well as in the R state. So when the pollen molecule E is absent from the environment, that means none of the active sites are actually occupied, and so the entire quaternary structure of this enzyme will exist in the T state. It will be very tense and very constrained. And so that means the affinity of all the active sites for the substrate will be low, and so it will display a low catalytic activity. But as those substrate molecules, and in this particular case, as the bisubstrate analog, the pollen molecule, begins to bind onto the active sites of the enzyme, what begins to happen is the trimers basically begin to move away from one another. And as more and more active sites are filled, the trimers move even farther, and as they move, they rotate, and they cause the dimers to also rotate and move. And that creates a quaternary change in the quaternary structure of that molecule, and that causes it to basically go from the T state to the relaxed state. It basically becomes less constrained, more relaxed, and the affinity of the active sites for the substrate molecule increases as this actually takes place. So, once again, as the substrate binds, in this case, as the pollen inhibitor binds onto the active side, it causes the two trimers to move farther apart and rotate, which in turn causes the regulatory subunits to also move. And therefore, the entire structure seems to expand upon the binding of that substrate molecule to the active side. And so, as the active sides become filled, we see that the tense state, the T state, transitions into the R state, and the equilibrium basically shifts. So, to see what we mean, let's take a look at the following diagram. So, we have this equilibrium that exists between the T state and the R state. Now, before we add any pollen molecules, when they are not present in the environment, in the absence of the pollen substrate or the actual substrate, the aspartate or the carbamoyl phosphate, the quaternary structure exists in the T state. And in this state, the enzyme has a low affinity for the substrate molecules and will display a low catalytic activity. On the other hand, as we begin to add the pollen molecules, they begin to slowly add into the active sites found in those catalytic trimers. And as they begin to fill those active sites, what that does is it moves. So this is one trimer, this is a second trimer. As the pollen begins to bind onto the trimer active sites, the entire trimers begin to move apart. As they move apart, they rotate and they cause the movement of these regulatory sites. And so the entire molecule basically expands, it becomes more relaxed, so it becomes less constrained. And what that means is the active sites of the other, uh, the other active sites which are unoccupied will basically increase their affinity for the substrate molecule. And they will be much more likely to actually bind onto those substrate molecules. And so ultimately, as more of the active sites become filled with those substrate molecules, the equilibrium basically shifts 
to the R state. And what that means is, at a high concentration of substrate, when most of the active sites will be filled by the substrate molecule, all the enzymes will exist predominantly in the R state, but in the absence of the substrate molecule, when none of the active sites are filled by the substrate molecules, that means all the enzymes will predominate in the T state. Now, the thing about the R state is, the R state describes this relaxed state, relaxed structure where there is not too much constraint and so the affinity of the active site for the substrate is high and that represents a high catalytic activity, a high catalytic rate. Now, what we still haven't discussed is where the CTP actually binds to. And how exactly does the binding of the CTP molecule to the regulatory dimer, that's where it binds to, how exactly is the binding of the CTP onto these regulatory dimers actually uh, inhibits, affects the activity of that enzyme. This is what we actually want to focus on in the next lecture. And we're also going to discuss what this molecule or how this molecule actually exhibits the process of cooperation. Cooperativity. So remember, the reason this molecule exhibits cooperativity is because it consists of these 12 different substances.